welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is part three in the incredible series Ghost Soldier from our good brother Rico's stories. When as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. The Blood Hunt. Prologue. Land of Shadows. Land of Death. Part 1. The Hunter and the Hunted. Lars was in Kentucky, finishing up on a 15-day training assignment with Captain Harrison Tate's newly formed cryptic unit. He was learning new fighting skills and weapons techniques while honing his existing skills in missions against different cryptids. He practiced with a small 150-pound pool recurve bow and shortened arrows with mercury silver nitrate tips. Teko Kagi hand claws with four inch blades, a small grappling hook with razor sharp edges connected to a long wire, and finally a heavier modified ninja toe sword with serrated teeth on one side of the blade. Well, Sergeant Adams, said Harry, tonight you hunt alone for a dark man that has been taking livestock from a farm in our area. Me and two cadre will be shadowing you. We'll lay back two or three hundred meters with a drone for overwatch. What weapons will you take? Now Lance looked down at the now Lance looked down at the table and studied a collection of weapons and said Hawk, I'm not taking a firearm tonight. I'm gonna do this old school. I want these Wolverine hand claws, the sword, the bow, and my trusty Rambo knife. All right, said Harry. Our Black Hawk leaves at twenty thirty hours. A hawk had taught Lance the Sepeku or whirlwind maneuver with Teko Kagi hand claws and sword. He said because Lance was so fast and could virtually see out of his body, like a 3D image, that this would be a tremendously successful maneuver for him. At 2220 hours, the Hilo landed on a large hilltop, overlooking a huge farm spread, as its four occupants departed rapidly and found cover in the high grass. When the sound of the rotor blades faded into the distant night, Lance stood up to smell the cool night air of autumn in the Appalachians. He sniffed the air for about two minutes under the clear starry sky. Lance stopped and caught a scent in the air and looked to the southeast and pointed. Now Harry gave him a thumbs up and Lance moved rapidly but quietly down the slope as the usual ribbons of light fog snaked their way through the hollows below him. And as he made his way down to a ridgeline, his senses were triggered. He now had a strong scent. Suddenly, his earpiece crackled with a message from Harry. Ah, Sabretooth, this is Hawk. Overwatch has you. Good hunting. Lance quietly responded. Sabretooth, Roger. Dragon south, southeast. As the ridgeline descended, the night sounds of the forest disappeared, and Lance began to creep silently as every hair on his body stood up. In the distance, there was the faint sound of cows in distress and the cackling of chickens. He quietly whispered into his mouthpiece, Livestock sounds, and sped downhill until his path led him to a pasture fence that he scaled like an Olympic hurdler. The fog was now much thicker as he approached the bottom land. His keen night vision was slightly impaired by the fog, but his sense of smell and hearing were heightened, and his sixth sense caused his skin to tingle. At last could now hear multiple heartbeats and smells, but one stood out. The heartbeat I was faster, and the smell was tart and musty. He crept closer and suddenly froze, as out of the fog, no more than fifty feet away, a large, dark figure emerged from the mist. It paused, letting out a low, rumbling growl, lowered its head, and bounced. Lance sidestepped the beast, but its speed caught him off guard, and it sliced his arm and shoulder as he rolled out of the way. Blood oozed from his arm as he froze for an instant out of his environment with this beast. He looked it in the eyes as his own facial and features quickly contorted. Then he keyed comms with a deep, raspy voice saying only one word. Contact. 
the dogman seemed confused for a second, and then charged. Lance charged again, but just before they collided, he leaned back and slid low between the beast's legs and raked it with one hand claws deep into his genitals. The beast went to its knees howling in uncontrollable pain. Lance took three steps covering the distance in a second and grabbed the dogman's mane on the back of its neck and pulled its head back with a surprising force and slashed its throat in one fluid motion with his knife. Blood spurted from the beast's neck as its body crumpled to the ground with a thud. Lance keyed his mic with two more raspy words. Target eliminated. Harry and his two men rushed in as Lance cleaned the blood from his knife. Ooh-ah! Sergeant, looks like you can add werewolves to your resume. Uh, by the way, before you leave, I have a small gift for you. Ray's name is Raymond Drake, and he killed a Gugwe at age 14. His life's ambition was to become a monster hunter. He joined the Marines and later the CIA, and he is up to his neck in all things cryptid. Part 2 A Blood Debt. Let's get straight into that. And during the plane ride home, Lance dreamed about his grandfather teaching him to hunt in the Ozarks at age 10. And just before sunup, they arrived on top of a big hill overlooking three converging game trails and with a stream running through the hollow. Hey, Duda, it's dark. I'm scared. Don't be afraid, little fox. The spirits will watch over you. Breathe. Allow your senses to fill your surroundings. As his grandfather quietly crept off into the darkness, Lance never ceased started to breathe deeply in and out. And after a few minutes, he was no longer scared. He could hear a squirrel climbing a nearby tree and a coyote howling in the distance. He was surprised that he could even hear insects walking along the forest floor. Now the horizon started to take on a reddish pink hue just before the sun peaked. Suddenly, he heard a rustling down in the hollow below him, with a faint sound of the stream trickling. He found himself smelling the air as a musky scent rose on the ever-so-gentle breeze. Lance couldn't believe his eyes as he saw a majestic eight-point buck cautiously foraging in a patch of laurel. He nervously clutched his Winchester thirty thirty as he waited for the deer to draw closer. He pulled up the rifle and took aim while taking a breath. He slowly exhaled and squeezed the trigger, startled as the shot rang out. And as the buck fell, he sat motionless, not knowing what to do next. Then, from behind, he heard White Bear's voice say, Very good, little fox. You are now a hunter. A duda had suddenly doubled back behind the tree to observe Lance. Now, upon returning to the base, Ray summoned Lance and Maggie for a mission briefing. He stood and looked directly at Lance and said, Ah, uh, we believe we found an Atolius. You two are heading out for the old country of Romania. Lance, you'll be solo for this mission, for fear of local spies detecting a spec ops team. You'll have a GPS tracking device and a high attitude drone for ISR. Now, I was able to contact three former Russian Spetsnaz, one having family ties to the area, who also speaks the language. They will have a legitimate cover of survivors working in the area. Her names are Ivan, Alexei, and Yuri, and they will be a few kilometers back shadowing the mission. They will also provide extraction via helicopter. The satellite imagery shows aircraft landing on a remote airfield and a helicopter loading items for transport to a cave opening where they lower their cargo in a net and leave it. These are remote mountains of Romania on the southern slopes of Transylvanian Alps, near the small and ancient town of Cotir de Arge. We believe this cave entrance leads to an underground facility where God knows what's going on. Get in, find out what is going on, and then take care of it. The B-2 bomber will be carrying a thermal barrack bomb, which will be used to destroy that cave and everything in it. You need to be a mile away when it detonates. At last sat quietly, then spoke. I owe Tom and my comrades a blood debt for what Anatolius and his blood suckers did and I cannot find peace until that debt is paid. Now the refugee crisis in Europe was alarming and unimaginable. It was as if this was by design, because there was no way to keep up with the large numbers scattering all across Europe. There was also no way to determine 
who went missing. Several corpses were found exsanguinated and missing organs. They were discovered in various stages of decomposition and horribly mutilated, and there was no way to make ID, even if you could find someone to do so. Well, who would miss a few here or there out of thousands? Well, Lance and Maggie would fly into Budapest and from there travel by train through the countryside until they reached their destination. Lance and Maggie arrived by train in this remote town full of supernatural lore, an area once ravaged by the Turks, sacked by the Mongols and conquered by the Romans. Kater de Arg is a municipality in Romania on the banks of the legendary river Argers, where it flows through a valley of the southern Carpathians. On the railway from Petitzi, where it flows through a valley of the southern Carpathians, on the railway from Petitzi to the Ternu Rosu Pass. Yes, the Carpathians border in on Transylvania, the historical birthplace of vampire lore. They were to contact an elder father of the church there, who supposedly knew the history of vampirism better than anyone. Part 3. Darkness Revealed Let's get straight into that. After getting a room at the small inn, Maggie and Lars proceeded to the St. Nicholas Church at the medieval Cater de Ages Monastery, built in the 14th century. Upon entering the church, they met Father Chao Banu, who seemed a bit cynical and distrustful for a man of the cloth. This was quite ironic considering his name meant shepherd. Lars began to explain that they were there to investigate the mysterious disappearances of people in this area. The father then stared at Lance for a moment and responded in a heavy accent. I understand. I must protect my flock from this evil. People go missing and they are never seen again. I keep their pictures on this wall. We light candles for each of them at sundown on the Sabbath. Are you sure you want to discover what lies behind the evil veil? Lance leaned close to the priest as his face slightly contorted and replied, in a raspy voice. Father, I exist on both sides of that veil. I am here to kill what dwells on the other side. And Father Chibuano tensed and leaned back while making the sign of the cross. He never see put his hand on Lance's head and said, Then may God go with you and guard you, my son. Now he motioned for Lance and Maggie to follow him and then led them down to the basement of the old church, where there lay an ancient burial vault. My son, said the father, here lies the remains of a warrior monk named Kresnik, who was once feared by Strigoi. He killed dozens in his time on earth. Well, the father reached into a crack in the vault and produced an old bottle, along with a necklace and pendant of some sort. Please, wear this amulet shaped like a crusader sword that Kresnik himself wore. It is said to be made from the metal of the blood-stained spear used to pierce a saviour's side. And in this bottle contains a scent made from the Strigoi that will mask your scent. Lance took the small bottle and amulet and thanked the father, even though he inwardly doubted its authenticity or its power. And Maggie asked, Where did these people disappear? Ah, from various places, said the father. But an area people fear most is at the north end of the river Ages. There is a cave there that nobody goes near. A few hunters and fishermen were frightened by strange sounds coming from there. One man claims he was chased by something. It is the most sinister of dark locations, lying deep within the cold, desolate hills of the Romanian countryside. Most have no idea of the existence of such a dark, haunted place. Fear fills the air in these woods. Some even say it is an entrance to hell. Lance found himself stroking the amulet while he listened. It was about half an inch wide and four inches long, attached to a tidy wound leather strap. And as he and Maggie left, he tucked it under his lapel. Now the sun was now setting, and it was time for Lance to start his trek towards the cave. Maggie would meet up with the three Russian special operators on a road near the inn, where they would take an old road to a point 
nearest to the mountain. Maggie and Lance embraced an exchange. I love you, as he gave her a curious stare. Ah, something is different about you, Max. Is your medication working properly? And she responded, oh, I'm just really worried about you, darling. They kissed and Lance began his journey. He ran quickly until he neared the area and then slowed to a cautious pace. Throughout the dark forest, an eerie silence descended like a heavy fog. What sounds there were were swallowed up by the thick old-growth forest. Lance stopped to rest and found a tree surrounded by brush to lean up against while he checked his GPS. Suddenly he heard a sound and noticed a new smell. He whirled to encounter an old man who had trapped a couple of rabbits that he carried by their feet. In broken English, he asked, Why, you American soldier, here in such a bad place, huh? I'm looking for a very bad man, said Lance. Ah, yes, you talk of devil man with devil dogs. What do you know about him, said Lance. And the man replied, This is evil place where people come to die, or worse. I only come here because my family need food and much game is here. Only a few people crazy enough are so desperate to hunt here. The old man pointed toward a mountain in the distance. You go there. You find what you seek. You don't come back. He looked at Lance with a dour stare and said, God be with you, and then crossed himself before turning to go on his way. Part 4. The Smell of Blood Let's get straight into that. From a hilltop, Lance peered into the distance of this never-ending maze of trees and hills. This country felt and looked like a mosaic scene from an old black-and-white horror movie. A dark canopy with huge tree limbs hung given the appearance of a never-ending tunnel. Something rustled in the bush and put him on guard. It was only a small bird that he had startled. Now deep in this almost uncharted land of flora and fauna gave away to rocks as the somewhat hilly terrain became an upward trek, and then a rocky climb. And just as the tree line started to end, he saw a rocky outcrop and a cave entrance. It was well after midnight and Lance had been travelling since nightfall. He decided to sit against a tree to rest for a moment and mark his GPS, and then he heard his grandfather's voice. Use caution, little fox. The ghost soldier will need a divine spirit wind to prevail. Lance would now make his last verbal communication before entering the cave. Overwatch, this is Tunnel Rat. Objective in sight. Radio silence from this point. Comms will be via text. Will advise when placing first comm booster. His earpiece then crackled with, Roger, Tunnel Rat. Picture clear. Overwatch. Out. Lance paused to cover himself in the scent from the bottle the father gave him, and he again curiously rubbed the amulet as he felt warm to the touch this time. At that instant, a smell followed by a sight caught his eyes, causing him to freeze in his tracks. Over the cave entrance, a massive snake with a cobra-like head slowly flicked its tongue to sample the night air. He could feel the ground under his feet vibrate as the serpent slivered into a coil position with its head leaned back, ready to strike. It had to be over twenty feet long. Its head swayed back and forth as it locked eyes with Lance, its narrow, vertical pupils fixed on him. Suddenly, it spit a jet stream of green venom at his face, which he narrowly dodged. He unleashed an arrow at the beast's neck that just missed. The snake rose its head to a height of about ten feet, but before the reptile could strike, Lance unleashed another arrow straight into his gaping jaws, and as it struck at him, Lance quickly rolled and pounced on the back of the beast's hooded neck while it swung him wildly down onto the rocky surface. And just before Lance lost his grip, he plunged his Teko Kagi blades into the side of its head. And as Lance tumbled over the rocks, the massive snake writhed on the ground, swinging its tail wildly. Lance righted himself and leapt on the serpent's back and had his neck with the sword while it rolled and tumbled wildly, slamming Lance to the ground, where he severed its head. The snake's headless body continued to roll and tumble down the hill violently, until slamming into the trees with a loud crash. 
he could only hope that this commotion hadn't given his presence away. He was bruised and winded, but crept back up the steep grade to the cave entrance. And as Lance entered the cave, the first thing he noticed was how relatively smooth the floor was. He placed his first comm booster about a hundred feet in and sent a text to advise Overwatch. A message read, Roger, ISR, on station. Lance was to place comm boosters periodically in locations for the best signal amplification. He then received a message from Ivan that read, QRF arrived, proceeding to cave entrance. He had no idea that Maggie would be following them in, and as Lance suddenly crept deeper into the caverns, he was bombarded with a variety of smells and sounds overloading his senses. It was the odour of blood, medicine, and antiseptics. Lance clutched to the rocks on the ceiling of the cave, creeping forward until his astonishment, he saw a crude underground medical facility with compartments carved out of the walls. It was a room full of computers and servers, and several bays or cubicles where people were strapped to beds undergoing some sort of treatment or experiments. These laboratories seemed to have people in a process of transition, not quite human, but not quite monster. Now some mildly groaned, and some cried out in pain while writhing and convulsing, but Lance dared not act because there were two armed guards at the entrance, and so he crawled onward, silently clutching to the ceiling. Part 5. Sheol, the Underground Lance moved forward until he was out of sight of the facility and crawled down to place another comm booster and sent this message. Overwatch, this is Tunnel Rat. Found experimental med facility approximately 350 meters in. Two armed guards at the entrance. Three personnel observed. The response read, Overwatch, Roger. Will advise QRF. Unknown to Lance, Maggie and the team had already penetrated the tunnel. Suddenly Lance froze as he heard a subtle footsteps approaching, and then he heard two faint but distinct heartbeats and smelled the unmistakable smell of Stigore. He quickly crawled up into the crevasses about six feet under the cave wall and concealed as two Stigore walked by speaking in low tone. He was amazed that he could smell them, but they could not smell him. Apparently, the scent the father had given him had worked. He could hear the two talking about some sort of upcoming harvest, but he didn't have time to engage them for fear of alerting everyone else. He knew he had to proceed and find Anatolius. What he did not know was that Ivan and his cohorts had their crosshairs on the heads of the two armed guards at the medical facility. They were waiting for Maggie's command to fire when Lance engaged Anatolius. As Lance moved silently step by step, his grandfather appeared in front of him. Little fox, there is much danger ahead. The Jumlin has two, Olunga Dongalala, guarding him. There are also four more Jumlin in this cursed place. The bad medicine here is so evil that it is sometimes felt through veil. There are many souls disturbed by this evil and will strengthen the great spirit wind like a cyclone. Even the spirit of your father is with you. It dude have faded, and suddenly Lance remembered his father's funeral, and throwing a small handful of dirt onto his father's grave when he was just a small boy. Then a familiar voice spoke and said, Yes, son, I remember that also. I wanted so much to tell you and your mum that I was there, and I am with you now. Lance whirled about to see an apparition, and was his father. Tears started to form in Lance's eyes, and he said, Daddy, is that really you? Yes, son. I am proud of the man you have become. You honor my memory with the bravery and valor you have shown. Now, I must go, son, but my spirit will be with you. Tell your mother I love her. He then started to fade as Lance pled, Please, don't go. But he faded and then was gone. Lance wiped his eyes and suddenly he smelled that same rank smell he'd experienced when he killed the dogman in Kentucky. It was time for Lance to go full monster and eradicate this evil. Lance now placed another comm booster and sent the following message. Contact imminent.
At last, quietly rounded a bend, when suddenly it was like the earth itself trembled, when a booming voice rang out. The voice said, Sergeant Adams, I see you have sought me out. It will be the last thing you do. Lance cautiously rounded the corner to see Anatolia sitting on a granite throne with a dogman on either side. The sight of his cold, empty, emotionless, black, hollow eyes was unearthly. The huge dog snarled and growled as saliva dripped from their mouths. In the background, there was an area lit by dim red lights with a series of large doors down a corridor where four more Stogoi emerged. A strange and overbearing power exuded from Anatolius, and a ringing filled Lance's ears. It made him feel uneasy on his feet. Only partially transformed, he wondered if he would have to prematurely let the monster out and risk being in that condition for too long, which could drain him. Should that happen, or he would need medical intervention much sooner. But now he had to clear his head and not rush in, which was probably what Anatolius wanted. And Anatolius spoke. You have killed many of my people, but now it ends. One dogman stood up to roar as the other crouched. Lance quickly keyed his comms and loudly said, Can't hurt, and then fired an arrow into the chest of the dogman standing erect, causing it to let out a roar. But the other leapt upon him before he could react, slashing through his vest almost down to his skin. He plunged his Teko Kagi into its ribcage and then kicked it off of him, only to have the other one upon him in seconds. He rolled rapidly as it slashed his shoulder and back. In a split second, he drew his sword and faced the two dogmen. They were on two legs now, and with both well over seven feet. One began to flank him as the other crouched for the attack. And then, Lance remembered what Hawk had told him about the Sapaku whirlwind maneuver. Part 6. Hell is real. Let's get straight into that. Maggie quietly whispered, Fire! to Ivan and Yuri, and their silence rounds impacted the heads of the two guards outside the lab entrance. Alexei rushed towards the laboratory with Maggie on his heels as Ivan and Alexei followed. And just as Alexei entered the door, the two Strigoi emerged, and the one in front took a burst from an AK-47 to the shoulder, then flung Alexei through the air where he struck the cave wall. The second one grabbed Maggie by the throat and lifted her off of the ground. Suddenly, something happened to Maggie, and her face contorted. To the vamp's amazement, she clinched his arm with sharp fingernails in a death grip and kicked him in the face, breaking his grip. The first Strigoi launched himself at Ivan and Yuri just to catch several bullets to the skull. Maggie now had the other Strigoi cornered with a pistol in his face, and she screamed, you are going to tell me everything that is going on here. Ivan and Yuri began securing the lab personnel as Alexei picked himself up off of the ground and limped into the lab. To Maggie and these seasoned operators, the sights and sounds were surreal viewing. The inhuman suffering of these poor people connected to the equipment by wires and tubes. With the Strigoi and the lab personnel secured, Maggie directed Ivan and Yuri to go help Lance while she began her examinations of those who had been experimented upon. The last instinctively went full monster and began to spin while striking with both sword and Teko Kagi as the dogman slashed him. It looked like this would be a battle of a thousand cuts to see who would be the first to succumb to their wounds as this ball of blood, fur and fury rolled across the cave floor, dislodging rocks and dust. Somewhere in the melee, a loud roar was heard as Lance severed the dogman's leg at the knee with his sword. But Lance would have no time to finish off this one before the other one clamped its jaws down upon his shoulder. Lance let out a loud and guttural growl as he thrust his Teko Kagi backwards into the beast's abdomen. It howled in pain and released Lance's shoulder as rage drove him towards the dogman whose leg it severed. The beast hobbled along the floor, striking at Lance with one paw while he severed the arm below the elbow. The beast crumbled to the floor on its back as Lance rammed the Teko Kagi into its heart. The beast gasped for air and went lifeless as Lance whirled around to see the other dogman standing about 30 feet away, panting and 
covered in blood. They faced each other down motionless as Anatolius stood up and screamed, Kill him now! And the beast charged. Lance remembered his maneuver to disable the dogman in Kentucky and quickly leapt forward, getting low with the sword in hand. He used his Teko Kagi to prop himself up for a split second to slash low into the beast's abdomen, causing entrails to spew upon the floor as the dogman fell flat on its face in agony and died. At last was weakened, but quickly righted himself to see the sinister hollow-eyed face, the face of Anatolius. He began to clap his leathery hands and, with his coarse booming voice, said, Bravo! You are far better than anything we have been able to create. At last responded, Are oh, you creators death and misery? What exactly are you trying to accomplish here? And Anatolius cracked a wicked smile and said, Control, of course. When you understand DNA, you can manipulate humans and their blood. They can become subjects willingly, and therefore become a food without the old, antiquated ways of hunting. And suddenly, a dude appeared out of the corner of Lance's right eye, saying, Go, soldier. Your soldiers have located you, and will be here in minutes. This jumlin is different from all of the rest. He is almost as powerful as the very first. The first, replied Lance. Who is the first? In time, ghost soldier, in time. But now you must focus on this one, and it is now time for ghost soldier to mount the spirit wind. And Anatolia spoke. I see you have a spirit guide to keep you on the straight and narrow path, boy. There is only one path for you to walk if you want to live, and that is the one I will prescribe for you. You will either serve me or die, and that includes your whore. Lars was filled with rage as bloodlust and instinct overpowered intellect, rage overtaking reason. It dude have faded and said, Calm yourself, control the spirit wind. It will be strengthened by many who have felt this evil beyond the veil. Part 7. The Death Wind Lance stared at Anatolius and asked, Tell me, how did you become what you are? And he responded, I made a Faustian bargain, just as forced bargained with Mephistopheles, so did I. When he came to drag me to hell, I bargained further. I said, what if I can give you thousands of souls in place of mine? Thus he proper read the offer to Lucifer himself, and I was transformed into the Vicralicus. Some called me a ghoul, but most called me vampire. And you, Lance Adams, are so fortunate to have the gift of walking in both worlds. You could be a king, you could rule over many and have great riches. Why would you have only one blood whore when you could have so many more? Lance tensed his body as his grandfather echoed inside his head. Go, soldier, listen to me. He knows you are strong, but he is searching for a way to distract you. This one is filled with wicked wisdom. And suddenly, Anatolia scowled told his four Strigoi to attack. Lars's bow was out of reach, and he realized that to pay this blood debt may require his own blood. Lars met the first Strigoi, who came at him with a skimata, and he dodged the first swing, but the other edge sliced across his midsection on the follow-up swing. Lars swung his sword upwards with a diagonal slice to the torso, opening a huge gash in the Strigoi's chest. The second one thrust a spear with a steel ball on the end, as Lance twisted sideways, his foe swung the ball around quickly, striking Lance in the back. He was becoming weaker, and his reflexes slower. He bore deep cuts and with blood filling his eyes. And as he spun around and trapped the spear with the Teku Kagi, and severed the spear handle with his sword, he heard several shots from silences erupt from behind him. Ivan and Yuri had just put bullets in the skulls of two Strigoi. 
and Antonius used his infrasound and caused Ivan and Yuri to become off balance and fall to the floor. And as Lance faced off with the Romanian Strigoi, he picked up the severed spear and ran it through the heart of the one closest to him. Only one vamp remained holding a battle axe and with a look of palpable fear on his face. They circled each other as the vamp displayed caution and fear. Anatolius angrily said something in another language and the vamp rushed in. It swung down as if to crush Lance's skull and he sidestepped in a blur. The Strigoi stumbled forward, taking two steps and collapsed onto its knees with a huge gash in its right side. Lance walked up behind it and sliced off its head. He then bent down and picked up the severed head and threw it at Anatolius' feet. Drained and operated on pure adrenaline, Lance looked up at Anatolius and said, Well, it looks like it's just you and me. The ancient Strigoi proclaimed, I am Anatolius Draculus. I was with Vlad the Third, known as Vlad the Impaler. I helped create him. I nurtured him into the great ruler he became. I even held a seat in the house of Basarek. But he had a weakness. Even with his bloodlust, he had feelings, compassion, things that I had rid myself of decades earlier. And after his death, I created what is now known as the Strigoi, and did what no ruler had ever done. I created a worldwide empire of vampires. And Lars responded, You are one maniacal SOB, but you were not the first megalomaniac who wanted to rule the world, but your kingdom is about to be without a ruler. And over his shoulder, Lance could see Ivan and Yuri struggling to regain their balance. And he said, Stand down, men. This is a battle I must fight alone. Anatolius jumped down from his granite throne and almost floated to a soft landing about ten feet from Lance and said, Well, boy, you have again caused me great difficulties, but this time you will die. They both squared off for a bloody dance of savagery. Anatolia sprang at Lance so rapidly he barely had time to react. His black, inch-long nail scratched the side of Lance's face, causing a deep gash as Lance span around, slashing at Anatolius's robe as he went by. Anatolia stared deeply into Lance's eyes, causing him to become confused. Anatolia zigzagged left and then right and slashed the other side of Lance's face. But this time, Lance rode faster and managed to slash Anatolius' back as he passed. He turned to face Lance with his black eyes now glowing red with an evil rage. Lance again heard Idudu's voice saying, Calm yourself. Your father was a great warrior also. He is with you now. Anatolius launched himself towards Lance as he braced himself with his Teko Kagi and sword at the ready. Anatolius caused his robes to fly up and block Lance's view. He stabbed and sliced as he was knocked onto his back. When his vision focused, Anatolius stood over him with his sharp nails at Lance's throat. Lance was physically spent, bloody and tattered, as he lay there while Anatolius said, Enough of this foolishness! Join me or die! And suddenly, Lance felt a jolt enter his body and a voice said, Son, I am with you, and I have brought the death wind. Part 8. A Bitter End Let's get straight into that. Anatolius opened his mouth wide, and it covered almost all of his face. His teeth grew longer and looked menacingly sharp. And as he tried to bite down on Lance, his gums jutted out like a shark, making it even more difficult to block them. Lance heard a voice in his head say, You have no idea of whom you deal with. The spirit of the fallen dwells within me. As Lance blocked with his left forearm, Anatolius's teeth bit down on his Kevlar and pierced his arm, causing him to wince in pain. And as Lance twisted to free himself, while fending off Anatolius's long nails, the amulet fell out of his lapel. 
Lance instinctively grabbed it and slashed the side of Anatolius's face and throat with it. He lurched backwards, slapping at his face with blood dark and thick, like oil oozing from his wound. Anatolius screamed. Where did you get that cursed amulet? He clutched the side of his face as it burned like a holy fire. This allowed Lance time to slice a deep gash to Anatolius's right shoulder, followed by a solid double kick, knocking the old vamp backwards. Extremely weak, Lance crawled about on his hands and knees, trembling as he looked for his bow. He had now been fully transformed longer than ever before. He shakily stood to his feet and said, Nine honorable men died because of you. I owe a blood debt that I'm going to collect from you. And at that instant, Maggie arrived and picked up Lance's bow and one lone arrow on the ground. As Anatolius straightened himself and ready to charge, Maggie struggled to pull back the bow and aim. And with her new strength, she managed to shakily pull back the string and loose the arrow, striking Anatolius in the side, just above the hip. Anatolius felt the mercury silver nitrate burn his side, and he fell to his knees with a scream. Lance turned to see the shocking side of Maggie, looking like a lesser version of him. But this battle had taken a toll on him, and there was no time to question her. He launched himself towards Anatolius, and they rolled across the cave floor, scratching and striking each other. He managed to get his hands around Anatolius' neck, but struggled to hold him down. He trembled as his strength started to fade. He needed treatment, and he needed it soon. He noticed the amulet dangling, and quickly reached up to rip the strap off of his neck and felt a hot burning sensation from it between his fingers. He thrust it into the side of Anatolius' neck, causing him to let out an ear-piercing scream. Anatolius clutched his hands around Lance's hand as a look of horror came over his face. He slowly loosened his grip on Lars's hand and began to speak. For almost fifteen hundred years I have seen both the best and the worst of mankind. <laughs> I have watched empires and nations rise and fall. I have played a part in many. To die here like this it is quite unfitting for a king. And Lance replied, Interesting how history does not mention you. Anatolius responded, History is a lie agreed upon by those who wrote it. Eh, maybe so, said Lance as he gripped the amulet, now almost too hot to hold, and said, Well, fuck you, your majesty. And then sliced Anatolius' windpipe. He crumpled to the ground, exhausted, next to Anatolius, as he gasped for air and clutched a gushing gash across his throat. Duda stood over last, telling him he must behead this jumlin and remove his heart. Maggie stepped up and said, Hello, grandfather. I will do it. She can now see and hear Lance's grandfather. And with Lance's sword in hand, she beheaded Anatolius and then carved his heart from his chest. Ivan and Yuri came to put an incendiary grenade on Anatolius's remains, and then Yuri ran back to the lab while Ivan helped Maggie with Lance. And Maggie gave Lance a quick injection, then Ivan helped Lance to his feet. As Lance hobbled with his arms around them, he turned to Maggie and said, What the hell did you do? I started gradually reducing my treatments three months ago and slowly began to change. No, he said. Why? Because this had to be done, Lance, and I knew you would need help. Shit, responded Lance. Now we both need treatment. Well, I'll only be a little more like you, said Maggie with a sheepish smile. Lance angrily shook his head. As they got back to the lab, they sat Lance down on the floor as Ivan went to ready their cargo for the helicopter that was inbound. And as Maggie further monitored Lance, a dude again appeared. And Maggie smiled and said, oh, It's a pleasure to meet you finally. Lance was a bit incoherent due to the sedative max it gave him. He looked up at his grandfather and said, A dude, 
I have a question. You haven't been watching while Mags and I... You know, have you? And with that, a small smile formed on that old man's face, and he faded away. Lance turned to Maggie and said, Now that Anatolius is dead, my blood debt is paid, but I don't feel avenged. I just feel empty. After all the evil that has been done, how can anyone ever do enough? Ivan, Alexei and Yuri hurriedly carried out four body bags and with the help of the lab workers as an old Soviet-era helicopter approached. And Lance said, Wait, we gotta load up the rest. Mag shook her head and said, The rest were too far gone. We were only able to save three, and the fourth is an extremely tranquilized Strigoi. And as they were loading the chopper, the pilot shouted, Botar a piece! Botar a piece! Meaning hurry up. The pilot lifted off and pointed the lumbering relic down the mountain. They started gaining speed rapidly. They were headed down the valley at full speed when a huge fireball erupted behind them, followed by what felt like hidden a pocket of turbulence. Part 9. The Discovery Let's get straight into that. At the debriefing, Ray was obviously frustrated as he stood and said, Dr. Ataru, your actions were not only without sanction, but very dangerous. You jeopardized your own health and the mission. Lance sat silent as Ray looked towards him. And Sergeant Adams, I see for once you were not objecting. Lance responded, Well, Mr. Drake, and paused. I feel the sentiment. Ray smiled and said, I see Captain Tate shared some intel. Maggie responded, Yes, what I did wasn't without risk, but it was necessary. If we are to defeat what they have created, it requires a team. Ray pondered for a minute and said, Not only do we have a real live vampire in our custody, we have a hybrid somewhat like you, Lance. But I'm sure Maggie has told you. But what neither of you know is that we have a problem closer to home. You see, we discovered the real purpose of the lab from the people and the records were covered. It wasn't to create more like them. It was to create more like you, Lance. And well, I guess you too now, Maggie. Ivan and his team recovered hard drives and blood samples. And now we have to root out these people and the hunt starts here in the USA. There have been dozens of cases of exsanguinated illegal immigrants on the southern border. And that is on both sides. And that doesn't include the homeless victims. So, you two, get some well-deserved R&R. We're putting together an intel package for a mission on American soil. As Maggie and Lance exited the briefing room, Max said, Lance... You want to go out to eat? Huh, sure, said Lance. Uh, what you in the mood for? And she thought for a moment and said, oh, How about a big, rare steak? And Lance rolled his eyes, shook his head as he grabbed Maggie's hand, mumbling something unintelligible. Epilogue The lines between myth and reality are starting to disappear. Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one, wow. Now that was absolutely show-stopping, chest-pounding and nail-biting all in one. And from the incredible mind of our good brother from another mother, Mr. Rico Stories. Well, Rico, what else can I say, brother? Once again, you just seem to hit the nail directly upon its head and cover just about every single bit of magic of mayhem that any legendary writer should cover. Of course, I hope you're well and happy, your family and friends alike, and I can't wait to jump into the next adventure in your back catalogue. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag 
Team Fear, and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, of course, if you can pen a story packing that much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. And I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you're all fighting fit and having a fantastic start to the brand new year. And as the summer creeps up upon us, I'm planning many adventures with friends and family, out in the wonderful wilds of the world, in the forests and caves, or up on the mountains and hills. Whatever it is you do, I hope it makes you happy and adds a bit of spark into your life. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.